It's great to be with you all today. Um, as Mark mentioned, I get to sit, for the last 13 years I've sat at the D School, which is Stanford University's hub for innovation. And because of my vantage point there, I happened to key in on this one phrase that Brad used in his presentation. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm ready to run through a wall right now after listening to that. I didn't know Bill Campbell, unfortunately, but hearing some of the stories, I'm just, I'm in awe that we even get to be a part of his legacy, so I'm honored to get to be here, and I hope what I have to share is useful and impactful to you. I wanted to mention this phrase here, zero to one, because it's often mentioned in this space of innovation. Mark asked me to come and talk about my area of expertise, which is innovation, design thinking, entrepreneurship. And zero to one is a phrase that gets used a lot. Peter Thiel wrote a book called Zero to One. It's kind of this notion, right, that there's this special class of people who are capable of breakthroughs. And breakthroughs are really my obsession. For the last 12 plus years, I've been obsessed with this question of how do breakthroughs happen? I don't know if anybody's ready to raise their hand and say, I want less breakthroughs in my life. Anybody want less breakthroughs in their work or life? No, not at all, right? And yet, if I asked you, how do you break through? What do you do? I think for a lot of people you go, well, I'm one of the one to infinity people. I'm not the zero to one, right? Like, I, it's, and to me, that's, it actually illustrates the profound misunderstanding we have of innovation. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about two damaging myths that if we aren't careful, limit our potential. My genuine belief is that every single person in, in this room is capable of achieving the kind of impact that all the zero to oneers that Bill, that Brad just mentioned, have achieved in their lives. But what stands in our way is our own thinking. And so I want to talk about this idea of zero to one, and I want to start with what I would consider to be the quintessential zero to one story. If anybody can take credit for being a zero to one story, it's this woman here. This is Bette Nesmith Graham. She's a single mom in Dallas, Texas, circa 1956. And what I want to do is show you how even Bette Nesmith Graham, a largely unknown figure, but to me a quintessential example of zero to one, didn't really start at zero. And if she didn't start at zero, for sure neither are any of us. So the backstory on Bette Nesmith Graham is she was working at a bank called Texas Bank and Trust. She was a secretary at Texas Bank and Trust, and she spent every day not taking notes like she liked doing, but erasing the smudges that the newfangled IBM typewriter left on the page. So about half of her day, she took notes as she was supposed to do, and the other half of the day, she spent trying frantically to figure out, how do I erase these smudges? It drove her crazy. Every secretary of that era dealt with that problem. But unlike the other secretaries of that era, because Bette Nesmith Graham was a single mom, she had to take on all sorts of side hustles and goofy projects and weekend extra jobs to make ends meet. And she experienced something in one of those projects that changed her life. One weekend, she was working to paint window displays at a department store. It's one of her goofy side jobs. And she's painting the window display, and she made a mistake. And she started using a straight edge razor, trying to frantically erase the mistake. And one of the painters came over and said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? She said, I'm trying to erase this mistake. And he said something that would change her life. This painter said, painters don't erase their mistakes. Painters paint over them. She went on to start a company that became Liquid Paper where she took that simple insight from that goofy side hustle and applied it to the problem she was bothered by in her daily work. She sold it for, in today's dollars, around $250 million, okay? Non-trivial outcome. Great example of zero to one, so to speak. But the thing that I wanna mention here is we all have at our fingertips the same foundational building blocks of a breakthrough that Bette Nesmith Graham did. She didn't start at zero. 
But I have a question for you because a lot of times this idea of innovation gets shrouded in mystery. So I want to ask you a very simple question. I have four daughters, one of whom is five years old, and I heard some research that suggests that a five-year-old girl asks more questions per day than any other human being on the planet, and I can say that's true. And she, like many of us, asks a question, sorry, the, the myth here, some folks make something from nothing. That's the myth of zero to one, and I want to dispel that. But the way I want to dispel it is by asking you first a simple question, which is, what's an idea? My daughter, Corey, five years old, says, Daddy, what's an idea? I would ask you to consider that. You think about, how would I explain it to a five-year-old? But I would argue that if we can't even understand the simplest term in the taxonomy of breakthroughs, how are we going to be breakthrough thinkers? How are we going to perpetrate breakthroughs rather than let them be like break-ins that catch us off guard? Here's my understanding of the underlying neural research. The brain doesn't create anything from scratch. The brain is incapable of creating from scratch, ex nihilo, so to speak. What the brain does is it takes two things it already knows and it connects them in unexpected ways. You can see that with Bette Nesmith Graham. One thing she already knows, my typewriter is always leaving smudges on my page and it's irritating. And then when she learned painters don't erase mistakes, they paint over them, a new idea was formed. By the way, there's still lots of one to infinity work to be done, right? She had to work with her son's high school chemistry teacher to concoct a formula for tempura. She worked with a local paint store. She had to use a lot of connections and things like that. But that foundational moment, I would submit to you, an idea is simply a connection. And it's actually phenomenally helpful when you think about it that way. You can almost think about it like Lego pieces. Typewriter smudges, painters paint over mistakes. New idea. I'll give you another example. I spent a lot of time working with a company that will remain nameless, but let's just say they're working on autonomous driving for electric vehicles. They are dealing with a well-known problem which is called range anxiety. An owner of an electric vehicle is always wondering, what? How far am I gonna get, right? So one of the engineers one day, imagine this, she goes to a coffee shop, She's sitting in a coffee shop, and a couple of folks with military fatigues come in. And she said, I can't help myself. I was eavesdropping on their conversation. I say, don't apologize. Eavesdropping is a fantastic innovation tactic. She said, I happen to overhear how they talk about how small jet fighters can't go back to the base to refuel. They do what's called a mid-air refueling. Did, did you hear that? We all, if you were conscious right now, we all just had a collective hallucination called an idea, right? Range anxiety, mid-air, what if you, all we're doing is taking two Lego pieces and putting them together, and collectively we go, can, yeah, that's what she did too, right? This is how, cognitively speaking, this is how breakthroughs work. We're taking two things and we're putting them together in an unexpected way. Why is that a gift to know? Because you're never starting from zero. Zero to one is a fallacy. Every day in your life, you're gathering Legos, so to speak, if you know it, if you're aware of it. One of the things that we've advocated for 50 years in the design program at Stanford is this notion of a bug list. By the way, this long predates software development, so I'm not talking about software bugs. Bob McKim, who's one of the founders of the design program at Stanford, instructed students from the very beginning of the program to keep a list of the things that bothered them. This is your bug list. You know what that is? Lego pieces. Jerry Seinfeld talks about how his entire comedy routine is fueled by his delicate, annoyable sensibility. Right? He's constantly looking for Lego pieces, right? So you keep a bug list, and then, importantly, you look out for connections. There's some fascinating research from Carl Dunker in the 1930s who was able to identify through a fascinating set of experiments called the, um, the fire problem or the Dunker's radiation problem that complex problems are difficult to solve unless you're told to look for similarities with other problems. 
And in multiple series of experiments, Dunker demonstrated that if you provide a potential connection, it's not enough. If you tell someone to look for the connection, they start going, oh, Lego pieces, right? Just like we did with the electric vehicle example. But if you don't look, you don't see. So you got to be on the lookout, okay? Here's a great example. Anyone know who this is? It's Bill Bowerman, co-founder of a company called Nike. He was Oregon's track and field coach. He was also the US Olympic track and field coach at a time. And he is credited with an incredible innovation. But I would say his wife, Barbara, should be co-credited with this innovation. Because if it wasn't for her, this thing would never have happened. The shoes half of us in the room are wearing, we wouldn't be wearing them. Because what happened at their breakfast table one day ushered in a revolution. You know what happened? The waffle iron. Right? It's now in Beaverton. You can see the waffle iron. Actually, it's probably, by the way, not V1. Because the story, as the story goes, Bowerman's sitting there kind of absentmindedly staring into the kitchen appliances when he thought, I should pour polyurethane in that. Right? And he ruined it. Right? So I doubt this is the original waffle iron. But the point is, he's looking for connections. And if you wonder, was Bowerman looking for connections? The truth is, and Phil Knight tells this amazing story in Shoe Dog, if you've read Shoe Dog, he was always experimenting with our shoes. Always, constantly. He said, as a runner in the Oregon program, I didn't know if I was going to win the race or hobble off bleeding because he's put different things in the soles. And any time we had a race, he kept two notebooks, right? He kept a notebook of the athlete's performance, and he kept another notebook of his experiment's performance. We wrongly think, you know what I should do if I want to innovate? I'm just going to gaze into the waffle iron. That's not going to work. Although, by the way, Steve Jobs often went to Macy's to look at Cuisinart for inspiration for Apple's early products. But that being, that being true, kitchen appliances aren't the answer. The answer is looking for unexpected connections. When you look for them, you find them. And Bill Bowerman was totally obsessed. He had a bug. What was his bug? He wanted his athletes to win, and he was always looking for an edge. But just like Bill Bowerman, you're aware. You have a unique view of problems to be solved. Just like Bette Nesmith Graham, you have a unique view of problems to be solved. And the question is, if you can look for the connections, you can go from thinking, i got to go from nothing to something, to realizing nobody starts at zero. And I'm not starting at zero. I'm living, I'm a sentient being progressing through every day, aware of problems, looking for opportunities, and if so, the concept of zero is a total fallacy. It's not, cognitively speaking, don't forget, the brain makes nothing from scratch. If you think Steve Jobs makes something from scratch, you're delusional. If you think Mark Zuckerberg does, or Scott Cook does, whoever it is, they're not starting from nothing. And the great news for all of us is, neither are we. So that's the first myth that I want to dispel. I did say, though, that there's two myths that I want to dispel. And this one's really, really fascinating. I'll start by telling a brief story. This is a photographer named Jerry Yulsman. He is a professor at the University of Florida. This is one of his famous pieces. I think it's kind of creepy and cool, so I put it up there. But he ran a fascinating experiment in his photography class that illustrates this myth perfectly. He divided his photography class in half. He basically said, OK, in the middle of the room, all of you all are going to be graded at the end of the term based on the quality of a single photo you have to submit. If it's an exceptional photo, you're going to get an A. If it's a good photo, you'll get a B. If it's kind of meddling, you know, it's Stanford, we grade on a curve, no, I'm kidding. You'll get a C, right? And, and so on, okay? All you have to do is turn in one photo. But we're going to have a, a judge and jury of, of photography experts at the end of the quarter, and it has to be exceptional to get an A. Then he said to the other half of the class, all right, y'all, the only thing that matters is how many photos you take. If you take over 100 photos, you get an A. Doesn't matter what they look like. Take photos of your belly button. I don't care, right? You take 90 photos, you get a B. Take 80, you get a C. Under 80, you, you fail the class. And then they went through the semester. He talked about photography techniques, trained them, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the semester, they had all the students submit their photos for grading by an independent jury of graders. And you know what they found? Not a single A came from the quality orientation group. All of the spectacular photos came from the group of people who were told, take as many photos as you can. It doesn't matter how good they are. It's fascinating, right? And here's the myth that underlies the zero to one 
concept. It's this thought that innovation is all about going from zero to the one. Emphasis on the, singular. That's not the truth. You can almost think, okay, I start at nothing, and I do a little bit of work, and I'm going to get kind of like, you know, point one. And I do a little bit more work, and it's going to be at a point two. And a little bit more work, point three. And a little bit more, a lot more, right? Finally, I get to one, ta-da, kind of a moment. And that's not true. This has been debunked systematically, empirically, across fields. My favorite example is a person named Dr. Dean Keith Simonton. He wrote a very difficult to read book that I don't recommend. I'll give you a Cliff's Notes if you want it, okay? <laughs> if you want to know how smart he is, he won a Lifetime Achievement Award by the organization that assigns IQs, okay? Guy's got it going on. He studied innovation through different fields, the sciences, the arts, invention, discovery. And you know what he found? What contributes to getting to really breakthrough outcomes? This is what his research suggests. This is your, your welcome, the Cliff's Notes version of what he found. The most important variable to getting a good idea is coming up with a lot of ideas. And in fact, the more ideas you come up with, the better chance you have of coming up with a good one. This is not only true in the arts, it's also true in the hard sciences in the hard sciences. He found, for example, citations are the way of demonstrating distinction in the sciences, right? And he would look across sciences and across time periods, and he'd say, when did the most eminent scientists do their most breakthrough work, the most cited work? You know the time period in their life it was? It was when they wrote their most papers. It's very predictive, right? And the same is true across fields as well. Instead of looking for a good idea or the good idea, what innovators know is the task is actually generating lots of ideas. One of my favorite examples of innovation is an individual named Linus Pauling. He's the only individual in history to win two Nobel Prizes. And he almost won a third, okay? He was neck and neck with Watson and Crick in discovering the double helix structure of DNA, and he just barely lost. So, but he would have won a third, right? And somebody asked him once, how do you come up with so much? Like, Three potential Nobel Prizes? How do you do it? And you know what Linus Pauling said? He said to have a good idea, you have to have a lot of ideas. And very few people appreciate what's a lot. How do you define a lot? Typically, if I go in a room and I say, how many ideas do you need to have to have a good idea? I did this recently. I had a talk to one of the world's largest consulting firms, all of their senior partners. There's like 500 people in the room. They're all sitting at little eight top dining tables. And I told them, the winning team, the winning table is going to, everybody gets AirPods at the table. And I kept mentioning AirPods to make sure that the organizer knew I wanted a pair of AirPods as well. Anyway, I got them. But the point is, I ask everybody, it's a competition, right? You know the average answer? 20. Except the table that had the chairman. You know what the chairman did? He stood up and he said, one. You only need one idea to have a good idea. It was very difficult to show him the research after he said that, right? <laughs> Exceedingly difficult, right? This is the truth. You need a lot of ideas, orders of magnitude more than you think to get a good idea. This is some research that was conducted by our colleague here at Stanford, Bob Sutton, where he demonstrated that basically, I've kind of done some rounding to make it simple. His actually started with 4,000 and ended with two. But the basic idea is to get one commercial success, you need to be selling about five things, meaning one out of every five things that get sales succeed. Great. To get five things worth selling, you need to make like 100 prototypes which is to say 95 of the 100 things you make don't really sell. That makes sense, right? But to get to 100 prototypes, you need 2,000 ideas, which is to say, you know, 95% of the ideas you come up with aren't building, uh, worth building. All of this makes sense in the funnel, so to speak, but nobody starting from the one, if I'm gonna go from zero to one, you missed the point, what's the point? You need to go from 2,000 to one, not zero to one, and zero to one presumes the next step is gonna be the break, and if I can't make that step, then I'm toast, and that's not true. And by the way, this, this is true in a lot of different environments, okay? It's been studied at firms like IDEO. In pharmaceuticals, the number's more like 10,000. Uh, Bill Dyson made 5,000 prototypes of the bagless vacuum, okay? That's like at the 100 mark, okay? So imagine the scale there. Taco Bell's food lab, one of the leaders of the food lab said that she tests on average 2,000 variations of taco shell per year. 
Is your mind blown? Mine is, right? Same thing with Saturday Night Live. Okay? Who's watched Saturday Night Live and been disappointed and turned it off? Yeah, me too, right? Okay, and the rest of you are lying, right? Don't raise your hand. We, it's like, this is a waste of time, right? They're a perfect case study in this, but they get the most viral clips as well. Not because they're producing a bunch of perfect material, but because they're generating tons of possibility and they're increasing their odds. Innovation is a numbers game, basically. And it stands, it flies so counter to this myth that what I need is one. What you need is shots on goal. That's what you need. And as athletes, I hope that's something that will resonate with you. I need to be increasing my shots on goal. That's my idea. And what, what, how, how are my ideas going to look? What's the quality? This is, if you've taken a statistics class, you know, a normal distribution. I would argue, like all other natural phenomena, ideas fall on a normal distribution. Okay? Which means what? There's a small fraction of ideas that are truly breakthrough. Okay? The vast majority of ideas we have are totally pedestrian. And there's a small fraction of ideas over here that we don't really like this part, but like, let's be honest, sometimes they're just plain stupid, right? And what happens is, and here's the danger of a zero to one mentality. It's like one has to be really good, right? One has to be the idea. And so what happens is we go, you know what? I really want genius. Ordinary is okay, but I just don't want goofy. So I'm, I'm going to do a quick demonstration here. So we go, I just want to chop off the goofy side. Wait, hang on. I just want to chop off the goofy. You see what happens? Innovation is a function of volume and variation. And when you try to chop off the goofy side of the distribution, what you do, whether you realize it or not, you're stifling the variation required to get to the genius stuff totally stifling it. And so basically you have a decision to make. Which distribution do I want? Do I want genius ideas? I got to put up with some goofy. You could even say goofy is the price of genius. Or do I want to avoid all goofy ideas? Great. You've, you've resigned yourself to a bunch of ordinary material. Those are your two options. Cognitively speaking, that's what you've got to deal with. And it's your choice to make. I vastly prefer the high variation, lots of stumbling, occasionally spectacular distribution. But it's helpful to know that it's not about going from zero to the one. It's about having tons of ideas, many of which totally suck, and it doesn't matter because that's the way to increase the likelihood of getting to the one, right? It's actually about going from thousands to one. And that's a way better proposition to me because I can generate thousands of bad ideas. That's great. And every once in a while, somebody goes, whoa, whoa, hang on, hang on. That was kind of good, right? But the person who goes, they're never going to get there. Self-censoring, others censoring, judgmental, critical, they're never going to get there, right? So the question, hopefully on everyone's mind right now, I'm not a mind reader, but I've done this a few times, I know, you're going, how do I boost the volume and variation of my ideas? You'll be pleased to know that's the subject of a 60,000-word book I just wrote. And... <laughs> And the, uh, the organizers of this event have been gracious enough to buy every one of you a copy, which is very cool. Comes out in October. If you, I think you have a link, but if you haven't seen the link in your materials, you can scan this QR code and you just put in your details and you get a free copy of the book. It comes out October 25th, and I am really eager to get your feedback. I'd love to share it with you. I'll flash this up again later, so if you're having trouble figuring out how to open the camera, you know, don't worry, I'll flash it again. Um, but I want to say, in closing, the key here, I believe, is to shift the goalposts fundamentally, again, to use a sports metaphor. Shift your goalposts. We are so quality-oriented. So what do we do? We spend most of our time looking for the right answer. And what I'd say is, every once in a while, you have to say, what if we try to come up with lots of answers? Doesn't have to be all the time. I don't want people in the cockpit brainstorming. I don't want to see post-its on the cockpit windows. But every once in a while, there's problems that are a good fit for lots of ideas. And to me, what we advocate is daily practice. You know, not, and you can do two-a-days if you want, if you want to go back there. Sorry if I just triggered PTSD. <laughs> you can do two-a-days. That's totally fine. But it's where you're regularly engaging, flexing this different muscle where you're saying, I'm just going to shift. Right now, I'm looking for a good idea. I talked to a leader of innovation at a global hotel company. He says, every time I feel like I'm stuck, I do an idea quota. What is an idea quota? Ten instead of one. That's it. 
What's the quality of most of them? They're normally distributive. There's some goofy ones. There's some illegal ones. And then there's some that I go, whoa, that's kind of cool, right? Wow, and now I'm not stuck anymore, right? What does it take? Three minutes. But the point is to deliberately and make it a, a, a lifestyle practice where you shift your orientation. I want to tell a story about my brother, Jason Maiden, because he was inspired by an athlete. He heard once that Michael Jordan took 1,000 free throws a day. And so you know what he did? He was an aspiring young sneaker designer in Chicago. He said, I'm going to make 1,000 sketches a day. So athletes have inspired creatives for a long time. But I wonder whether creatives are inspiring athletes. Designers are taking plays out of your playbook. They're saying, man, i got to get in my reps. i got to do the work. i got to take free throws. i got to take practice. He, a thousand sketches a day is insane. By the way, he's designed some of the most iconic shoes that the Jordan brand has ever made. But it's this practice mindset. And the beauty is, as it pertains to creativity and innovation, here's my belief. Every problem is fundamentally an idea of problem. Meaning tasks that are known, you know how to execute it, you just get it done, great. That's not an idea's problem. I would argue, though, that many tasks are actually problems in disguise. A problem yields to what? Possibilities, solutions, ideas. Tasks just yield to brute force. But I've found in my life, and I'll give you a personal example here, I found that a lot of tasks actually could be problems that are deserving of innovation, if only I'd think about it. One example, I live in a house just down the you know, six miles away from here in Mountain View. Our house faces west. So what does that mean? The sun setting is brutally hot, which in California terms is like 74 degrees, right? It's brutally hot on the front porch. Um, and of course, we're always getting grocery delivery in the middle of the afternoon. And so there's like the alarm bell rings. It's like, warning, the ice cream's melting. And we've got, all got to scramble to the front porch. That is like the last thing I want when I'm in the middle of a Zoom meeting. Right? So for me, I kind of roll my eyes and I go, I got to do, and it's a question of like, how many of these bags can I carry before one of them rips, right? Well, one day I couldn't do it. You know what my daughter did, my 10-year-old did? She gave her sister a ride on a magic carpet and carried more bags of groceries than I've ever carried in a single trip, right? And it just goes to show, this is, and by the way, her sister doesn't look too happy, does she? <laughs> what is happening here? The point is, it's an idea problem. She thought she couldn't do what I do, which is muscle through, and she actually made a way. You know who does the groceries now? Evie. We all win. It's great, right? But, but my point is, innovation, if we think about it like it's an event or a sprint or a workshop or a hackathon or whatever, we put innovation as, oh, it's that time I do that thing, right? That is a mistake. Innovation is a practice. If you are not innovating, you are not an innovator. But the good news is, you can be an innovator if you start innovating. It's simple. And taking that different mindset is key. Last example. This is my little sister. This is me and her. She's eight years younger than me. And she, I used a particularly grainy photo for this part because she wouldn't want a high-res image of herself being projected here. But she was a high school volleyball player. Okay? I want to talk about the practice mindset real quick because you all can fill in the blanks before I can even finish this. We go to the grocery store. My, my mom says, Rachel, would you grab a jug of milk? You know what she does, right? She goes to the refrigerator, or whatever you call that thing, the cooler. She pulls out the jug of milk, and on the way back to the cart, what does she do? Curls. Why? You do it. I do it. Right? To an athlete, every gallon of milk's a dumbbell. Right? Who does not curl the jug of milk, right? Is it just me? Is it my family? Right? No, we all do it. Right? Because we have that athletic mindset. Right? Well, to an innovator, you think about, sorry, I went back, backwards. To an innovator, every problem is a possibility to engage a different mindset. Why not go for volume here for just a second? It can be just as reflexive of an instinct if we build it up as curling the jug of milk is to my little sister. Imagine how insane it would be if I said, Rachel, what are you doing as an athlete today? And she goes, oh, well, my coach isn't here, and there's no volleyball, and I'm not on a court. I don't have my knee pads on, so nothing. It's like, imagine how long her volleyball career would last, right? No. Anytime I have the opportunity. She's like sprinting to the car to go get something, right? Why? Why not sprint? 
The point is, if you just change the mindset around, there are so many opportunities for practice, you create an amazing opportunity to really engage this innovation muscle. To go not from zero to one, but to give yourself the at-bats and the shots on goal to go from thousands to one, which is actually where you need to get. So here's the QR code again, as I wrap. Looks like I have 20 seconds left, which I feel like is really sticking the landing, so thank you. Um, but if you want to get the book, we'd be delighted to hear from you. You can reach out to me. I'm trying to think there may be a couple. I blog about this stuff every day. You can subscribe there if you want. It's called Paint and Pipette. I try to write like two or three minute long kind of stories about people like Jason Maiden or Bette Nesmith Graham or, you know, random students that I interact with. And then the last thing I'd say is I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. If any of you want to connect, I would love to. I've already had a couple emails from some of you and a couple of... Uh, LinkedIn messages as well. I look forward to staying in touch, and I thank you so much for your time and attention. Have a good one.